Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming to our discussion of Forbidden Planet. Uh, I am joined by one of our instructors, uh, a fellow uh, Northwestern graduate, and uh, the person who created that instructive introduction, uh, Mabel Rosenheck. So we will be uh, doing our best to field your questions and uh, sort of move the discussion along. Uh, if you are not asking a question, if I have not called on you to ask a question, please keep your audio on mute. Um, in addition, on the bottom of your Zoom window, there is a way for you to raise a hand and that will be how I know uh, who is interested in asking a question. Um, you can also do some chats in the chat window. Uh, our colleague Jill is monitoring that and will let me know if uh, anything that needs to be addressed by us comes up, but people really sort of enjoy talking to each other in there as well. So that's, that's totally fine too. Um, before we get to the questions that I'm sure you all will have, um, we are going to, uh, I think, start with some questions that we got that came in online. Um, one of them, well, I'll start off with um, um, a pretty, I guess, down the middle of the road one that relates to a few that we got. One of the things that a lot of people notice about this film, quite understandably, and Mabel made allusion, allusion to this in her introduction, uh, are the sets and what we would sort of call the production design, which includes the sets and the props and all those sorts of things and is related to the costume. And um, the costumes were done by a couple of different people for obvious reasons. Anne Francis's costumes were done by one person um, and the others were done by another, but the production design really stands out in this film. And it was done by two people one who had an extraordinary and very long career in Hollywood, the other who didn't have all that much of a career in Hollywood. Um, the one with the long career is Cedric Gibbons. Uh, the other one is Arthur, Arthur Lonergan, who did not make all that many movies. Um, but Cedric Gibbons um, made dozens and dozens and dozens of films. He was sort of the MGM in-house uh, art director, uh, set designer, who um, was in, with the studio from the 20s uh, and until his death in 1960. He actually designed the original Oscar statue. That's how closely involved with the industry he was and how far back he goes. Uh, he also, I believe, holds the record for most Oscar nominations. He was nominated for 39 Oscars and he won a dozen of them. So uh, yes, it, you know, it makes sense that he, uh, made quite an impact with the sets and the props because uh, he was very good at his job. Interestingly, this was, since was the, this was the first science fiction film that MGM did, uh, he hadn't really had a chance before this to sort of visit this genre and this, this time period. So I think he, he took it and he really, really ran with it. Um, and I imagine that once the budget was nearly doubled from a million dollars, which is already a pretty good budget for a genre film, uh, at that time, once it was doubled to nearly 2 million, he must have really just had a field day um, with it. We got a question about a particular sculpture in Dr. Morpheus's house. Um, I can't tell you what that sculpture is or where it's from, except to say I'm sure it lived for many years in the MGM Pops department. Um, but beyond that, uh, I can't do any better. Um, Mabel, is there anything you want to say about the sets or anything like that? Yeah, well, I'll add that I think a lot of them, was, which was, of course, co common for the time, were reused in other films. And so uh, my understanding is that a lot of them were reused in the Twilight Zone, in Twilight Zone episodes. And, of course, Robbie the Robot um, both specifically gets reused in other, in other films and television shows. Um, and also that sort of broader design was certainly innovative um, and sort of set a, set a precedent for what other robots were going to look like. So those specific aspects... Um, of what the future, what science fiction was going to look like, were um, were also uh, were also certainly part of are part of what the film did in the present it set. Yeah, and one of the things I'd be interested to to hear from people if before and if they don't have questions is 
Um, can you spot the ways in which this film was influential on Star Wars and Star Trek and other science fiction things that came after it? Um, a couple of examples really, really jump out to me. Um, I found uh, the design of the sort of um, underground alien expanse to be similar in some interesting ways mm -hmm. to the Death Star and other designs of evil places from Star Wars. Uh, I also found it interesting that when the the, um, the crew of the spaceship is sort of getting ready to transition from light speed or hyperspace to uh, getting near the planet, they go into things that look a lot like what Star Trek would use as transporter um, station. So, those were two that jumped out to me. Um, Mabel, did you see anything else along those lines? Um, you know, one of the things I'm always interested in is sort of the, is also the exteriors, is those kind of desert, those way out west desert exteriors. And those certainly weren't new. Um, the idea of using those dramatic, you know, national park type out west exteriors um, wasn't new to, to this film. But that's one of the things that really strikes me Re revisiting the film this time is that combination of those space age interiors and then those dramatic sort of desert, you know, mesas and all of that kind of thing. Um, how both familiar they are and then the particular juxtaposition of those. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because you, you sort of makes you wonder that when they were getting ready to, to do Planet of the Apes in 1968, did they think, gee, where on earth can we find what looks like, like another planet? And they were, of course, out in the American Southwest. And you can imagine they might have gotten a suggestion from, from this film. Yeah, um, yeah. I see we do have uh, someone with their hand raised. Uh, David, do you have a question? Well, I'm, I want to follow up on your comment about Star Trek, because you almost would want Star Trek to have specifically acknowledged the stealing of the Beam Me Up Scotty tubes from this film, and at least the little bit of, of uh, reading that I tried to do, I didn't see where that was acknowledged. And yet, you, you know, you picked it up. There's a couple of things. That one was like so dead on. Um, I was wondering whether there was ever a, an acknowledgement. Uh... I mean, not any sort of formal acknowledgement. I mean, Roddenberry admitted that this film was influential in Star Trek. Um, and I think part of the, I think part of the reason that I, I know some of you found this film sort of you couldn't, you weren't sure whether it was meant to be a parody or a satire. Of course, the actual thing didn't exist yet for it to be parodied and satired. Like this is one of the first sort of stabs at this. Mm -hmm. But part of the reason, you know, we think that or the film might come off that way is because, I mean, what was every Star Trek episode? The, the captain goes down to a planet and meets a, a, you know, what we've been told is a female, you know, resident of that planet and tries to sort of make time with her. And of course, what do we see in this? Um, and the same sorts of uh, dynamics about, you know, gee, which crew members is going to be disposable when they're set out on the trip and, you know, and I get to explore and all that. So um, there's a lot of things that are borrowed. And this is one of the challenges we have with watching films that come earlier and early in a genre or from many decades ago, we've been conditioned to react one way to something that at the time was being presented in a, in a different light. Right, and that's why I, in my introduction, I think I characterize it as very 1950s in terms of being both ahead of its time and this whole space age theme and exploring these themes about technology, but also now when we look back on it, it feels very 1950s, which means that it feels a little bit dated. It feels, you know, yeah, it feels all of those things that you're describing. Uh, I see James has a question. Okay, James seemed to go away. Michael, do you have a question? This is uh, Francine and Michael. Oh, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, one of the things that struck me watching this was the absence of any females on the spaceship. And it really struck me about how that was so part of the time uh, that the film was made. And uh, even though many of the characters were similar to what we saw in Star Trek and Star Wars and things in the future, but they did not continue to have that representation of women's role in those projects. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
No, go ahead. Go ahead, Mabel. I, I was going to say it's a reminder of what of how innovative Star Trek was. That you know, there's ways in which these both of these are very much of that mid-century moment. But yeah, Star Trek, especially you know, having women, having having a black woman, you know, on the crew was absolutely really innovative and was really ahead of its time. And it's it's one of the other interesting things about the movie. I mean, there's an extent to which, and I think in a way, this was one of the things that helps set Star Wars apart, but there's a way in which you can almost always tell that, you know, a science fiction film is that periods or that decades view of the future. I mean, 2001 is, you know, is a film that has technology and goes places that people weren't going in 1968, but the design of it is so 1968. And even some of the sensibilities, a lot of the sensibilities. And I think the same is true here. I mean, the way they, the, so, you know, in the 250 years between when this film takes place and when it's made, you know, they've, someone's been able to create a robot that can create any amount of any material, but people still think that that will only be of interest to women who do all the cooking. Right. It's it's they talk about it being the, the robot and his ability to generate, create food being, you know, a boon to housewives. And the the idea that um, the things they thought could change or would change and the things that it didn't occur to them to even entertain changing um, tells you tells you a good amount about the time in which and the culture in which the film was made. Uh, James, are you back with us? Yeah, sorry, I had to pop out for a second. Okay. Um, I was just interested in the sort of the parallels with uh, sort of the Tempest and what thoughts you have on that, because there were some bits that were, you know, the general premise was kind of along those lines, but there were a lot of sort of, it was, it just seemed to be kind of a grounding idea of of the planet itself rather than really the plot as a whole, unless I missed some bits. Mabel, did you have thoughts on this? Um, it's been, I, this was all something I just had to look up on my own after I watched the film, because I can't remember anything about The Tempest, which I maybe read in college. Um, but yeah, definitely that uh, the premise of, you know, the, the father marooned with his daughter on a, this is a foreign planet, that's, a, you know, an island is there. Um, but I think one of the ideas is that um, both are concerned with, you know, it's, it's more magic in The Tempest, and obviously it's more science and technology in um, forbidden planet, but the idea that these things that they're about power, um, that they have that they both literally have the power, magic and science have the power to transform things and have the power, uh, the power to do something and, and change the world, um, but that they're also about what we do with them, what humans do with them. Um, and then I think part of the idea is that Caliban in T the Tempest is a bit like the monster that you see in Forbidden Planet. So again, the idea about 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 humanity and its relationship to power, whether that's whether that's magic or whether that's technology, um, and how you know there's a, I was going back and, and looking at my notes before we were starting tonight, and there's all kinds of language that um, Morbius and um, and Leslie Nielsen's character use that that very that actually really grounds you in what's going on in the Tempest. Um, what does he say? You know, they talk about. They talk about the primitive. They talk about um, you know baser instincts or some of the kinds of things that come up, which are things that are very much about Caliban as this primitive in in the Tempest as the as the Eden and all those kinds of things. Um, but there are some differences as well. Um, the way the ship comes to land on the planet is different than it is in the Tempest, um, and there are some other different um, dynamics. Mix. And I think more, there was a question we got uh, online about whether this was intended by the writers. And um, from what I could find, I, I don't think it was. And I, I think that, you know, these sorts of premises and these things kind of, um, you know, into, there's, you know, there's a reason why um, Shakespeare has, his work has lived on. And it's because he had this ability to craft these stories that resonate. And I think the premise on some level resonated with the writers of this film, but I feel like most of the sort of deal about it being inspired by The Tempest, um, I wouldn't go so far as to call it a remake of The Tempest, um, 
came sort of in the years and decades later rather than at the time. Uh, Mabel, did your, did your research indicate anything different? Um, I, I didn't look into that question, but one of the things I will add in terms of those parallels is that, you know, uh, there have been arguments that the Tempest was also about colonialism and about colonization, which certainly the idea of colonizing foreign planets um, that's coming up in this film specifically, but also just in general, and the idea of space travel, the idea of science fiction, really tells us something about whether they're human instincts or Western human instincts or whatever that is, that there is this idea of how we relate to foreign places and relate to new places that I think is something, is this, this theme that we have in common, whether or not the, the film is drawing explicitly on the play or not. And I think that that's telling. And, it, but it is also interesting that the, um, the, you know, the indigenous people from the planet in the film are completely removed and gone before the timeline of any part of the story even starts. So they kind of get out of having to deal with that question, which, um, you know, you know, I think arguably might have been too many things for one movie, um, especially given the, the lack of the seeming lack of subtext and subtlety that they had in making this. Mm -hmm. um, but that is that is convenient related to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, uh, Darcy, do you have a question? Okay. Um, uh, Jonathan, do you have a question? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, yes, comment and question about the sound design. Um, I mean, there was no music in the traditional sense. Uh, it was electronic sounds. Um, and it, it sort of seamlessly was part of the background and part of the action, um, which I thought was was interesting. And it was often difficult to tell where the background sound, like a film score, morphed into part of the action. Uh, in particular, the approach of the um, the approach of the subconscious creature. You always knew when it was coming because there was this pounding thud and, and this other background sound, almost like the approach of the shark in Jaws. And there it was every single time in one, one way or another, um, which it was, just, it was just an interesting use of that sort of sound, um, which was not called music in the credits. It was called electronic tonalities. And um, my wife and I would both noticed that that's how it was credited. I wondered if anybody knows anything about that. Yeah, um, so this is, you know, one of the landmark elements of this film is that it's the first film, uh, American film to have a fully electronic score. Um, and uh, there are sort of jokes, I think, about how um, it could save money um, on uh, in production if they weren't considered musicians and you didn't have to pay them sort of some sort of musician scale. But I, I don't I don't know how true that is um, because they spent plenty of money on this movie. So that doesn't seem like a big expense, relatively speaking. Regarding your point about not being sure when the soundtrack score um, is part of the background of the ship or Morbius's, you know, palace or whatever is a really interesting question, right? Because in the parallel you drew to Jaws, of course, we know that if we're out on the water and the, the orca or whatever, and then we hear music, we know that that's the soundtrack and it's there to cue us as viewers. And this is a really interesting, this is a kind of interesting theoretical area because there's a word that um, is used to describe things that occur or can be sensed within the world of the film, things that characters can hear, things that characters, sounds that characters make, and it's called diegetic. And almost everything we see in a movie is diegetic. If you see a character talk, the other characters know it. You see a character drop a book, the other characters hear the sound. The biggest part of most movies that isn't diegetic that the characters don't hear is the soundtrack. And 
and different filmmakers at different times have sort of played with, you know, blending that, you know, making it so characters in the movie heard the soundtrack and so on and so forth. But this is an example because of the nature of the soundtrack not being musical that you really don't know. And that adds, a, I think, another interesting level of viewing and uh, an interesting other sort of consideration for, or at least the potential for the filmmakers to play with. Um, let's see. Uh, Richard, you have a question or comment? Okay. Uh, Linda, did you have a question or comment? Hi, thank you, Andrew. Uh, my question is about Walter Pigeon, and I thought I had sent this through to you, but maybe it didn't make it. I wondered what he was doing in this film. I mean, he's a classic, terrific actor. Uh, the other actors in the film, I would say, were at the time B actors. Do you have any insight on that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you did send that through, and that was on my list of online questions, but there's nothing wrong with that, asking it again. And um, I think that, um, you know, if you look at Pigeon's filmography, I know that in the early 40s, uh, he was in some really notable films, How Views My Valley, Mrs. Miniver. But if you look at his filmography and his work in the, the rest of that decade and into the 50s, you'll see that it varies widely. And he wouldn't be the first actor who who didn't only limit himself to what he saw as being prestige um, productions. Um, I also happened to read that he was doing a lot of work uh, on the Broadway stage in the 1950s as well. And perhaps that was sort of sufficiently highbrow for him or at least enough of a creative or artistic expression for him that he also wanted to pay the bills. So he would appear um, in movies. I didn't see, and I don't know, the other thing that just occurred to me, and I'm not sure, um, I, I'd have to look this up or you could Google this, is if he was at, by that time under contract with anyone. It seems to me un unlikely that he would have been, but some actors still were. And if that's the case, and he was under contract to MGM at that time, there's really only so many times you can say that you don't want to do a given movie until you, but before you're branded a troublemaker. Um, so, so that's how I would respond to that question. And I'll add that this film has a slightly un unclear place in terms of quality, because it's certainly, you know, it's, it's, and I think people have been mentioning this in the chat as well, is that it's certainly sophisticated for a science fiction film, and especially for a science fiction film of its time. And yet it's not, it's not being created as a prestige picture or anything like that. Um, so while that doesn't necessarily, I mean, I certainly can't read Walter Pigeon's mind, can't predict what, what he was thinking or what other folks in the production were thinking, it is a film that, you know, may have had different investments in it at different times in terms of casting, in terms of production, you know, in terms of all of these different elements that would make it more or less of a quality film, more or less of a prestige film and, and all of those kinds of things. But as, sort of as you said, and as I mentioned, a budget budget approaching $2 million for a science fiction film in 1956. And if you think about what they did, they brought in a team from Disney to do the special effects. Um, they, they were, MGM was clearly really high on this project. Um, I, I'll, it, was a, it was a departure for them, uh, certainly. But uh, so, you know, so as, as Mabel says, it's sort of a bit complicated. There are certainly things that point to it being kind of a low end production, but then they're Yeah of things that point to it maybe not being a prestige but on its way to being prestige production and and maybe that's how pigeon saw it uh let's see uh richard do you have a question or comment uh yes uh yeah. let's talk a little bit about monsters of the id uh when i saw it as a as a kid that's the one thing i didn't understand about the movie Everything else about the movie I loved. And when I saw it like 20 years later in the theater, I appreciated it even more. Well, it's so it's interesting that you say that because the film was re-released in the early 70s as part of like an MGM Kitty Matinee package. So, you know, a, a lot you weren't you weren't the only one to appreciate it as a child, and you weren't the only one to see the potential of this film as being of interest to kids. But the Monsters from the Id is 
um, is sort of the, you know, other than the thematic, the character, the non-visual thing about this movie that really stands out. Um, and Mabel, I know you talked a little bit about why, why this type of monster at this time. Do you say a little more about that? I mean, yeah, I mean, the big thing is, is that there was such an interest in psychoanalysis and such an interest, interest in psychology in the, in the post-war era and, you know, in the 1950s. Um, so much interest in, you know, understanding those things scientifically and, under, you know, and, and interest in understanding, you know, the human condition and understanding the human mind. Um, I feel like I was going to say something else about that. Um, but I think it's also, and then I think it also plays into this other big element of, of what the film is about, which is this question of technology and this question of, you know, in the 1950s, obviously nuclear technology had, you know, exploded in the 1940s and all of these other space age technologies um, uh, were emerging. And this, they bring that, to, the film brings that together with these ideas about psychoanalysis to explore, sort of to explore the nature of humanity and to explore the nature of humanity's interaction with the world around it. So I think you get two things going on in the film. One is humanity's interaction with technology, how it can be sort of perfected, how it can be rationalized. And yet we still always have this baser instinct at stake. And then you also have that element of, of psychology, that element of psychoanalysis that is even more interior and more about, you know, humans in and of themselves or maybe humans in relation um, to other humans. Um, so it's really playing, I think, on those two elements and bringing together those two aspects of humanity and technology and society and the, and the individual. Yeah, I mean, science fiction movies are very often about, you know, there's this new technology and isn't it wonderful, but oh, isn't it also terrible? And the reason it can also be terrible is because people can be terrible. And this movie, um, you know, granted relatively early in the genre sort of makes, brings that theme front and center, but brings it front and center in a way that, that is, you know, ex makes it explicit. And it makes it explicit because of what Mabel was talking about with that interest in popular culture um, and the awareness in popular culture of psychology and Freudian psychoanalysis and things like that. In the post-war years from, you know, the late 40s well into the 50s, you really see a lot of people in the entertainment industry be not just interested in psychoanalysis and Freud, but really thinking that it was this revelation that everybody would be interested in and appreciate. It's why David O. Selznick made the movie Spellbound, the Hitchcock movie Spellbound. Um, and it's why you have the, the um, concern about, I shouldn't say it's why you have the concern, but it's a strong element of the concern that you have in the um, Kefauver hearings about juvenile delinquency. And we think about this film and we don't tend to think about it related to to, to that topic and we shouldn't, but this is coming out a year after Rebel Without a Cause and Blackboard Jungle, movies that are implicitly about um, psychological issues affecting human behavior. And I even think about um, another film that um, I was uh, teaching in our film noir class, The Big Heat from 1953, which is a cop movie, a film noir. You would, last place you would expect psychology to pop up but when Glenn Ford's talking to his wife about how to raise their daughter, he's talking about what the book says and how to create the right sort of character and all these things. So it was something that was a real big presence in the culture of the time. And this film took it on in a very kind of overt, direct, and, and I think interesting way. Uh, let's see, uh, Lee, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, uh, you were talking about uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ah, you were talking about the soundtrack, and I read in a number of different sources that they weren't allowed in the credits to call it music. That's why they had to call it electronic tonalities. It had something to do with objections from the musicians' union, I think. <laughs> so maybe, so that's interesting. Thank you for mentioning that. Maybe that's that bit about unions and and credits that I was thinking about. Um, yeah, one, one other comment. Yeah. Um, thematically about the monsters from the id, that was uh, replayed 
kind of in an Outer Limits episode, the original Outer Limits, it was called The Man with the Power. And uh, it's, a, it's a different story, but this um, guy played by Donald Pleasance had something implanted into his brain that enabled him to uh, draw power from j just all around space cosmic energy and that eventually destroys him well that that is uh, has a lot of parallels um yeah. certainly thank you for that um let's see um michael do you have a question or comment okay uh Mr. janet Mr. oh Mr. go ahead michael i'm sorry go ahead michael um kind of playing off what you were talking about the about pigeon and this being whether this was a a, a top drawer film or something else. I, I'm I'm curious whether you could fit this film into the the broader sci-fi genre that we would kind of think of today. What was the I would think this is fairly early, but not not the earliest. Uh, wh where would you where would you put this in that development of that genre? Well, it, it is early, um, but as you say, it's not the earliest. One of the interesting things about it, in a way, is that like a number of films of the 1950s, it's sort of a science fiction monster hybrid. This one gets firmly and squarely placed in the science fiction camp because it takes place on another planet, the first film to where that occurs. Um, it, um, it looks, it's set in the future, they have different technology. I mean, it has all the trappings and it is a science fiction film, don't, don't get me wrong, because of the involvement of technology. But the idea that a movie like The Blob or The Thing, which are roughly contemporaneous, those movies aren't all that different. The Thing from Outer Space comes to Earth, but um, at the same time, it's a sort of unstoppable force that isn't understood and wreaks all this havoc that in, you know, in some sort of thematic, you know, um, way uh, has something to do with different cultural anxieties of the time. Uh, and that's something we can talk about with this film beyond the, the psychoanalytic element. So it, it is, it is early, it is early in the sort of that genre that will mix kind of space and you know, the military or, or battles, although there's literature, a lot of literature of this kind being written at this time. Um, but if we want to talk about science fiction films, they go all the way back at least until um, uh, starting with George Melies' uh, uh, 1902 or 1903, A Trip to the Moon, which is based on the Jules Verne story and is, is a, about 12 or 13 minutes long, but it's just what it sounds like. There's Fritz Lang's Metropolis um, in, uh, 31, I think, um, maybe maybe it's even the late, no, actually it's the late 20s. It's a silent film, it's the late 20s, um, which is a landmark science fiction film that would have probably an even greater reaching influence than this one. So in the grand scheme of the science fiction genre in motion pictures, this comes in about the middle in, the, in terms of sort of the one that kind of seems to have, you know, taken, had the biggest impact or been the most popular sort of thread of that, which is the Star Trek, Star Wars, whatever, it's it's pretty early in that regard. And I think it's just as useful to think about it as in the 1950s, this is when television is taking over and movies need to reorient. They need to be bigger and better and they need to remind you of why you want to go see a 30 foot, you know, see a 30 foot image. So I think the idea that like you want to see these strange worlds um, and you want to see them on that giant screen, that that's when it, what's going to get you out of the, out to the theater, I think is, is just as useful in thinking about why science fiction is and why they might have invested in a film like this at that particular moment in time. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really, really good point. Um, because they are trying to think at this time, they're thinking, what can we give you that the little box in your living room can? And one of them is a big wide image and the other one is a color image. And for MGM, that typically manifested itself in period Technicolor musicals, um, you know, Singing in the Rain or An American in Paris or 
um, earlier, Meet Me in St. Louis. I mean, that's what MGM was known for. But it's it's true. Um, and that's a really good point that once you decide a movie is going to be in big screen format, which the sets would have and the setting would have suggested, once you decide it's going to be in Eastman color, a special color process, which the, the movie obviously suggests, then you're sort of off to the races for an expensive movie and you might as well kind of, you know, do it up, so to speak. Um, and I think there's also, I think I read somewhere that they invested a lot of money in the spaceship in making it a surprisingly, surprisingly large scale. I can't remember what it exactly was. Um, so it's just another indication that that sense of scale, that sense of size was really important as to why they were making this film. Yeah, I kept trying to figure out how when they land, when we, when they land and they start to exit the ship, I was trying to figure out how is that not actually a physical object, but it, it was a physical object. They spent a lot of money on. Um, but interestingly, television plays into this in another way, which is that the movie studios were beginning to be production facilities for television production. They would rent out their facilities, their space, their tech, their equipment for television. So um, as some people have mentioned, uh, these props and sets would get used again and again. And I wonder if MGM sort of knew, well, this genre probably isn't going away. So we can spend, you know, $200,000 building this part of a spaceship. And I bet we'll get to use it again for an outer limits or twilight zone down the road. Uh, let's see, uh, Janice, do you have a question or comment? There you go. Um, yes, um, my comments were somewhat covered because it was very much about the unconscious id as well. But what struck me that I thought about as I was watching it was that the theory of psychology has gone away so far from the, uh, those psychiatric theories that it wouldn't go over as well today. So that that was very much of the time as well, I thought that that made it very 50s, that, you know, people, it has progressed really beyond that. That was the beginnings. And the other thing was that I was not totally clear about was the death of the, the original inhabitants and even those that died when we found that he was really the monster. Is the implication that he was the monster of all the killing? from the beginning or not i i think that you mean the beginning of what we see in the film or the beginning of the whole timeline before the film when his ship landed and all that exactly the beginning of the timeline in other words uh he's the monster now he's the one doing the killing now with his id what about the people that he right. brought with him is he responsible for that is he responsible for the death of whatever inhabitants were on this planet to begin with? I don't think, that's a really good question. I don't think we're meant to think he's responsible for the original um, indigenous inhabitants of the planet. I think we're, we're meant to think that those people had for whatever reason were gone and he discovered their tech technology. Okay. I that think, being said, the question of his fellow crew. Oh, go ahead. Yes. I think my my impression was that the original people that what were they the Krell or the yeah, the Krell, that they essentially massacred themselves with their own use of their technology. Or that they created the they created the same monster that Morbius did that did them in. That was sort of how I understood understood what happened. But I agree there's some confusion as to how the Krell died and then how the people on Morbius's ship died. Right. And that's, I was wondering what other people thought about that. Well, th thank you, Janice. That's an interesting question. Um, I, I think, right. I think it's, it's interesting to think about the Krell because of course they would have to have something resembling human psychology. It would seem for that machine to work, but I, I think you're probably right that there's an implication there that they were done in by their own creation. Uh, but I think the more interesting question is that cemetery we see out in the distance, mm -hmm. it's out Morbius's window that has the graves of his fellow crew members, including the woman who became his wife. What did them in? And I think I think we're meant to think it's this technology 
technology and people's unconscious, their id sort of running amok. And now that um, Morbius is the only adult left, um, we're meant to think think that it's his id that's running amok. It does make you wonder though, why um, his daughter Altera's, um, you know, id doesn't seem to take over the monster. Which, Which was why I thought he was the one that killed all the others on the crew, except for his daughter. No, I mean, I, I can certainly, I can certainly see that. And I, I think at different times I've seen this, I've wondered whether it was always his mind um, that did in the whole crew or was it as Mabel suggested which I think is a more complicated and interesting reading that different <laughs> members of that original expe expedition sort of at different times did each other in which which fr frankly like I said is more interesting but also makes more sense um let's see uh Susan do you have a question or comment Monster. Oh, someone was um, executing the subconscious uh, uh, Susan, I'm sorry. There's something about your connection or feedback from your speaker that makes it hard to understand you. If you can maybe adjust on that, adjust that. I don't know. Is that any better? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, it's hard to it's hard to understand what you're saying. Um, perhaps we can come back to you. Um, Linda, did you have a question or comment? Oh, I wanted to comment on who killed who. <laughs> From what I remember in seeing the film, there's an encounter that um, Leslie Nielsen's character makes with Morpheus, where he says it was Morpheus's mind uh, rebelling against those others in his original crew wanting to leave and go back to earth. And so there's something related that we haven't talked about with that mind machine that the Corel developed. And they do spend some time on how that thing is used and it expands your mind. I, I didn't quite get all of that. Maybe if I watched it again, I would have. Uh, somebody else or some other folks might have some insight into that. but. Just to respond to the conversation taking place, I think it was Morpheus who did the others in. And of course, he's not going to do his daughter in. And they make a big deal out of the fact that the wife died of natural, quote unquote, causes, which means he didn't. Right. Right. No, that now that you mention that, that that does that. I do remember that. And of course, it makes sense because he he says he and his wife, I believe, were on the losing end of the vote when people wanted to abandon the planet. Um, and so, although then that begs a question, why did they want to abandon the planet if they hadn't had any you know, problematic encounters or any mysterious killings or anything like that? But, um, but what you said does, I, I do remember that now, and that's the implication. I think it's kind of a deduction uh, or an assumption on Leslie Nielsen's part, but uh, but that's good enough for me in most cases, so I'll take it here. Um, also, immunity comes up. There's a there's vague references to some people to some people having immunity to something that Morbius and his daughter have immunity that nobody else does, and it's unclear to what. Um, which you know, there's a lot going on in there. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. right. No, it is. I mean, it it, it is, and there's other sort of psychological dimensions and we could we could you know sort of speculate about but something that's coming up in the chat that i think is interesting um and is a very good line of inquiry is looking at this film in terms of what if any kind of political messages it has is there any sort of political allegory in this film as was typical for films of this genre um, and some others at that time and as people have mentioned on the chat was certainly certainly true of Star Trek. So um, I think that's something that a number of you all would probably have some thoughts on. Um, I have a few. I'm wondering if you have any, Mabel, on that question in particular. Um, I mean, I think, I'm not 100% sure. I think that 
I think that nuclear technology is, is one of the obvious places to go is that this is obviously it's a somewhat oblique allegory, but that it's that's the that's the central problem that we have right now that raises this question of how we should relate to technology, what we should do with it. If we've created this thing, like, you know, will it take over? I mean, I think nuclear technology, especially in the 50s, is a huge thing of if we if we started this, can we stop it? Um, I think, uh, so I think, and I think there, I mean, and this is, you know, it's the fifties, so of course, but there are certain references. I can't remember what they are now, but to, to, you know, atomic something or other, whatever it is. Um, so that's the big one for me, although, you know, that may, that may come from, you know, specific reading, specific understanding of the 1950s, as much as it's really necessarily the reading that, um, that is implied by the film itself. Yeah, I think there's reference to atomic power, at least uh, in terms of how their ship mm -hmm. um, gets propelled through the, you know, through through space at light speed or something beyond it, I think they said. And of course, it's interesting because they, they didn't have, I don't believe they didn't have nuclear submarines or nuclear aircraft carriers yet, yet but, but they would before too long. And I, I think you're right. I think that a lot of science fiction films in particular have that sort of that sort of specter of nuclear weaponry is is lingering um, in those films. And I think the idea that, you know, just because you have an invention or you discover a technology um, doesn't necessarily mean you're kind of equipped to handle it. And that was one of the major concerns, even by some of the people who were involved in creating the, the first nuclear weapons. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think that, so I think, I mean, I think nuclear technology is a, is an obvious place to go and is probably likely in terms of what's being discussed. But, you know, one of the things that I think about more and more is, you know, the internet technology, all of the communications technologies we're using now were born in many ways in the 1950s in one way or another are, you know, these kinds of communications are emerging, obviously not literally the way they are now. Um, but, you know, the 50s is, is a moment of, of, of vast technological change. So it might not even be specifically speaking to something specific, but it is still a moment when things are changing very quickly, technologically speaking, much like they are now, much like they have at other, other specific, you know, particularly pivotal moments in time. And when I have a movie from the 50s, then it has something to do with the mind and people on different sides. I always go to communism and McCarthyism, things like that, though I'll have to admit, I don't find a sort of clear analogy for that in this film um, as much That's as- That's the idea of colonization. I mean, certainly the idea, can we get to every place as quickly as possible? You know, it's true in space that they want to beat the Russians there just as much as it is in Vietnam or in Afghanistan or wherever. Um, so I think, it, I think that is, yeah, absolutely relevant to some degree. That's a good point. Um, Kathleen, do you have a question or comment? Okay. Uh, uh, Richard, do you have a question or comment? How would you compare the monsters from the id with the how computer in 2001, a space odyssey? I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, in some sense, they're both powers or technology that the people who um, created them and were trying to wield them couldn't, couldn't control and didn't understand. Um, I think that there's a bit of an interesting, I, I don't know if it's, I guess it's sort of a parallel and sort of a difference that, you know, where rationality comes in, right? Because the id isn't rational. And as much as Morbius and everyone tried to be rational, um, he couldn't control his, his subconscious. And as much as Hal was designed to be rational, um, they created an artificial intelligence that was sort of too good that it moved beyond pure rationality. Um, and, or, or, it, depending how you read the film or read how it took rationality to its logical conclusion, which is the concern about, you know, developing AI technologies today. So I think there are some, some interesting parallels. Uh, Richard, did you have another question? No. No. Okay. Um, are there any other questions or comments out there? People are unusually 
uh, reserved today. Andrew? Andrew? Um, oh, there we go. Dana, that's who I was looking for. Well, you'd probably be disappointed because it's not a really profound question, but I'll, I'm curious about the animals. Um, I was sort of expecting some kind of a Circe uh, person who had changed some beings into animals and obviously that's not the case but I don't know what the animals were meant to represent and and of course then the, the lion who turned against the tiger, uh, the tiger. The, okay uh, what was all that about so I, I hope I'm not disappointing you but <laughs> that's my question no it's it's a good no it's a good question right because in a sense the you know everything else is different on that world but they still have a deer and a tiger and, and whatever um I I think that there's it's interesting because much like the question from a few weeks ago about another film from the same period that I know not everybody was a huge fan of on the night of the hunter the animals in a sense are meant to represent innocence and the fact that the kids um, in that movie and in this movie um, Altera uh, when she is innocent and sort of pre pre-development in her in a fully psychological sense or a fully human sense she is at one with the animals she has a naivete and an innocence and she's at one with the animals but it's 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 no coincidence when the tiger does turn on her right um it's right after she's been kissing uh the commander adams and so i think there's two possible ways to to read that um, and I don't I don't want to monopolize if, if you have thoughts on this Mabel or should I just keep going <laughs> well this is not a thought it's just, I suppose it's a question it's where does Robbie the robot fit in because he's the other figure that is not human so what I like this is literally I don't know what the answer to this is even remotely um, but I think Robbie must fit in somewhere in terms of some of this <laughs> well um, I'll, before we get to that, I'll get back to my, my previous thought, which is that um, I can see sort of two, two basic reasons why the tiger attacks when it does. So one is that she has, um, she has kissed Commander Adams. As you know from when Commander Adams goes back into the house to talk to his colleague, he talks about there being a new complication, which I guess means that unlike the other guy who tried to or was kissing Altair, at the beginning of the film with Commander Adams and Altera, it's true love. And their, rela their relationship is going to complicate things with, with Morbius and the tiger didn't like, like it. Now either the tiger's attacking because Morbius somehow knows what's going on and that's, that's a monster from the id. But what I think is more likely is that she's no longer an innocent. And so the way the animal got along with her when you first see her and she hasn't been however you want to imagine it either corrupted by the visiting um, men or was not intrigued or aroused by the visiting men she's no longer an innocent and the tiger is no longer treating her um, nicely so that's what I would say regarding that um, let's see oh did you have more on Robbie the Robot or you just wanted to point out that there's this kind of this character where, you know, doesn't fall neatly into any of these categories? Yeah, um, that and that, you know, he has, yeah, he's, he's sort of a, he's sort of a background character and yet I, I am certain there is m more to say about who he is and, and his role um, sort of as a character in the narrative. I don't really know what it is. Um, but it also, you know, when I was poking around thinking about looking at the deal the relationship to the tempest they also talk about how robbie the robot might be something like ariel who is like a nymph or spirit or something so somebody who knows more about the tempest can speak to that can certainly speak to that better than i can um i don't really have a point except to say that there's likely some richer material or richer idea embedded in there in robbie as this other figure that is sort of liminal right between he's not human but he's more human than you know the toaster or whatever it is like that and so um you know the way in which if 
the way in which he reflects Morbius in some way, maybe, or, you know, has some other, other role to play in terms of um, relationships between humanity and technology. I bet those reading are, readings are there, even though I'm not totally sure what they are. I think can it's I also- in? Can I jump in? Oh, sure. Okay, um, I, I do just, I just do agree completely that um, Ariel in The Tempest was supposed to be Robbie. I was, I was about to say that. Um, Ariel was very important in The Tempest. Ariel drove a lot of the, the plot and had a lot to do with Prospero, who was the, you know, the Morbius character. And um, there were some places in this where Ariel in The Tempest was the one who dealt with the comic relief characters and got them drunk. And I thought that clearly Robbie was the one who got the whiskey for the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 got the cook. Oh. Um, and I, I think he it sort of lends, he, he sort of engineered a lot of, she, he, I don't know, Ariel was a man or a woman, um, but he did, he did sort of the bidding of Prospero and, and it sort of was similar. It was one of the places that I think the movie was successful in picking up on something that was a part of the Tempest. Um, also the, the, the part of Robbie, which um, Morbius created, I guess it was Morbius who created him so that there was the morality there that um, Robbie would not turn against somebody because he was, he had man's conscience or something. That was very much like Ariel as well. Ariel um, had a lot of the, the morality questions that he could bounce off of Prospero too. So that's the one place where I thought the Tempest really played into this movie the best. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Well, thanks very much, Dana. That was, uh, that was really helpful. Um, uh, Spencer, do you have a question? Uh, yes, my um, <clears throat> well, actually, it was the the uh, the first thing was uh, I need to go back and look at it. But I thought the tiger was attacking the man and uh, not attacking the girl. And so, if the tiger was attacking the man, I felt the tiger was kind of jealous because uh, had this this friendly relationship. Um, uh, no, so you. that was that was my my one comment. Uh, my other comment was to uh, just uh, agree with what Dana said that uh, it's it, it's intriguing to me that Mobius created Robbie and gave Robbie a conscience, but at the same time, Mobius it, it's you know it, it was the the id from Mobius that caused all the trouble. Anyway, those are my two comments. No, I, I appreciate those, and and you could be right about him attacking the man. I also know that that, that Commander Adams sort of steps in front of her and, and pushes her back in a sort of defensive posture. So I'm not sure exactly what got the tiger so so angry, but your your reading could certainly be right. Um, regarding the other point, I think it shows us sort of Morbius's um, at least intelligence when it comes to self preservation. He wanted to make sure that um, Robbie couldn't kill him, right? And one can. Imagine that even if, if Morbius suspects that he's he himself is the one causing this havoc on the planet, it would be even more imperative that um, that Robbie couldn't couldn't harm him. Uh, let's see, uh, Susan, do you have a question or comment? Okay, uh, David. Yeah, I want to go back, Andrew, for your, your comment on the innocence. Um, I had been thinking a little bit about it being a little bit like the Garden of Eden. It didn't quite um, comport, but as long as she was innocent, the Garden of Eden was near perfect. And her bite of the apple was the kiss with, with uh, Adams. Of course, it wasn't just that they were banished from the Garden of Eden, but, you know, the, the tiger was trying to kill her. But in fact, there was there was some similarity there. Uh, I thought that you were going to come to it before, so I figured I'd throw it out and see what your thoughts were. No, I think I think that's another interesting analogy, and you know, and you can certainly see that that Morbius feels that way. I mean, the way he the way he wants them warns them away. I mean, partly he warns them away for their safety, but really, I think it's more so they don't. They don't do anything to disrupt what the good thing he envisioned that they have going there, um, which is, you know, tells you something um, unsavory about Morbius, I would say. Uh, but I, no, I think there's definitely, I mean, I, that's the other reason. 
reason I think, you know, for the animals, you make a good point is to sort of kind of help push that metaphor along or, or crystallize it a bit. I think that's a good point. Um, Gus, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah. Um, the, uh, there's a line from the famous line from the Tempest that uh, Aldous Huxley uh, took uh, is Brave New World. And that's a cautionary tale about what can happen with technology. And there's that interesting scene when uh, Morbius is showing um, uh, Leslie Nielsen and the doctor, They're, they can't look directly at the, uh, the power, powerful, uh, I guess, uh, atomic energy uh, of, the, of the Krell. So it's kind of like this idea, you know, you're not supposed to look at the, at the Medusa, I think he says. So it's this idea of like man's arrogance that he thinks he can control what he creates. And that's really the basis of all the, the movies that like Frankenstein all the way up to the uh, current uh, AI uh, cautionary tales. Yeah, that's, that's a, a good point. Thanks for making that connection, Gus. Um, Richard, did you have another question? No. Okay. Uh, Linda, did you have another question? Uh, I had some comments. Okay. First of all, I, I wonder they uh, examine the sexual components to this film. And I found, although I understand it, um, Anne Francis, her dress was just so sexually provocative, although, you know, she does come out in that one longer dress trying to do her feminine uh, uh, satisfaction for what the um, Adams character wants her to, you know, cover up. But there seemed to be, there's this flirting that goes on with one of the other crew members. There seemed to be a, a real sexual component, and yet the woman was so submissive and I also wanted to say that I haven't read The Tempest or studied it, but this certainly makes me want to, um, until I have time now, <laughs> to go and do that. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, thanks for sharing those comments. And one unexpected benefit of the series we're doing is getting people to read more Shakespeare. So I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Um, but, uh, no, there's, I mean, there's, there's lots of things about sexuality going on. I mean, the, all the crewmen gawk at her and some of them make, you know, really kind of very forward and inappropriate comments about her. Sometimes is in the presence of her father, um, certainly in the presence of Robbie. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you, you know, she's with that first crew member and she, you know, there's all, there's all sorts of, you know, in other genres in the 1940s and 50s, there's all this stuff about sort of, you know, like I think about, you know, melodrama and the sort of so-called women's film, all these sort of things about the right type of woman and the wrong type of woman and how, you know, a woman needs a woman needs a man, but she has to choose the right man. And this this film has all of that. I mean, she she kisses that that first officer sort of almost forces himself on her, but she never feels anything with any of the kisses because he's not the right man and then one conversation with Commander Adams and she's, as you said, Linda, dressing the way he wants her to dress and, and being very submissive. I mean, it's, as I said at the beginning, for all the advancements and cutting edge, you know, ways that human, the human race had evolved in the 250 years, um, that one hadn't moved forward an inch. Um, okay, uh, lead. Did you have another question or comment? Comment about the um, Tempest. Uh, I've also come across uh, references to a parallel between the monster itself from the id and the character of Caliban in the Tempest. Hmm. Well, I, I, I have to confess, I, I don't have enough familiarity with the Tempest to be able to draw up that analogy, but perhaps Linda, who's going to now read The Tempest, can report back to <laughs> us um, about that. Um, I but say, uh, I, I encountered a tiny bit that um, is, you know, it's a when I was when I was looking at this when I was reading up for um, for this discussion, it seemed like a lot to unpack, a lot that needed to be unpacked. But I guess, I mean, Caliban is, I'm like, I guess Caliban is a 
you know, crude anagram for cannibal. So he's very, and we're talking about this sort of, in some ways, a colonial, an allegory for colonialism. So he is, you know, he's representative of the, you know, non-white other, the colonial other. Um, and the idea of like the powerful, you know, uh, Western colonizers, uh, sort of brute instincts, right? The things that he can't erase, even, even though he's rational, even though he's, um, you know, has West, I mean, has, more or less Western science in this case, you can never erase that those baser instincts. And so in uh, in the Tempest, it's that's projected into into this colonial narrative, and he's made into this this primitive figure in a very specific 17th or you know 16th century context. Whereas here, it's a similar you know now it's here is projected onto this psycho psychoanalytic framework of the id. Um, but still, it's that idea that somewhere, whether it's in our societies or whether it's within ourselves, and I think that dialogue between the individual and the collective is very key in thinking about where psychoanalysis fits in, especially in films. Um, I think that that relationship is really key in terms of this film is a little bit more focused on the monster as Morbius's individual sort of baser instincts, his id, his th his elements that are not rational. Whereas in The Tempest, Caliban is a little bit more broader, more collective, more social, the way in which we project certain things, certain quote unquote primitive aspects of ourselves onto the other in particular, onto the colonial other. Um, so that's sort of one particular reading of The Tempest and how it might compare um, to what's going on in Forbidden Planet um, in, in those different historical contexts. Uh, Daphne, do you have a question or comment? Okay. Um, Spencer, did you have another question or comment? Yeah, this was just, uh, I, this, this, from what Mabel was just saying, um, one of the things that Caliban uh, want, uh, tries to do is to rape Miranda. The, the female character. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that the first crewman is just interested in the woman for sex and the, uh, the, the captain is, uh, so he's in that way, he's more like a Caliban figure. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the second man is actually in, in love with Miranda, which is Ferdinand and the Tempest falls in love with Miranda. Uh, so I just wanted to comment on that. No, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and I, I think that's a, a good note to end on, that the similarities uh, between The Tempest and this film are certainly um, numerous, and there are um, variations to be sure, but there's a lot there to chew on. And I appreciate that all of you have helped uh, us flesh it out, as did our uh, guest moderator Mabel. Thank you so much for joining us, Mabel. You're welcome. Uh, so, if you like this discussion uh, and you are new to these, you can sign up for our sign up for our weekly e emails at gridmarkfilm.org, and you will be told uh, with every Thursday email what the following Monday's film to be discussed is. You will also see a video or link to a video for uh, one of the instructors to uh, who gives an introduction to it. Uh, so please consider signing up for our weekly emails. Uh, please pl br visit BrynMarFilm.org. Uh, check out Theater 5. We have some new films streaming there. Uh, look at our Film Studies Online section. There's a lot to check out there. And if you like what we're doing, we would love for you to consider making a donation to the Film Institute as well. Um, until next week, uh, thanks everybody for joining us and uh, have a good week. Hooray, wonderful. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.